Good afternoon or good evening and welcome to a Tewa talk uh, with 80 Harvests. Because we can't travel with the ongoing pandemic, I'm going to travel virtually and uh, interview Carla Tiago, who's the winemaker at Quinta de Boa Vista, and I think she's just joined. So let me invite her to join us here. Just waiting. Oh, Carla, hello. Hi. Bonjour. Hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And you? Good, thank you. How is everything in the Douro? What's the weather like at the moment? Well, today it's a little bit cloudy, but uh, it has been sunny, so, and it rained a lot during January, so we are expecting a good year. Let's see what's going to happen from now. Excellent. Fingers crossed. And um, I want to, we're going to taste through your wines and we're going to talk a bit about the, the, the kind of terroir of the Douro and, and making still wines in what's obviously the famous port region. But before we started, I wanted to ask you about your experience. And because I understand you grew up in the Douro, you're a, you're a local. Well, I, I, I'm from there. But I grew up here in Porto, so I lived there until I was five, and then my parents came to Porto to work, and uh, uh, so I studied here. And but we were, and we are going often there. So like twice a month, we go there. Until I was twenty-five, I'll spend all my holidays there because I have plenty of friends, and uh, well, uh, a part of me is is is, is there. So and. Uh, uh, it, it, this is an incredible place. So it's in Upper Douro. It's in Torre de Moncorvo, a small village, very small, where everybody has small vineyards and uh, olive trees and almond trees. So, and we have it there. My, my parents have uh, some, some of these uh, in there. So we go often there to help them and to relax. And it's, it's, it's in an incredible place. Nice. And does any of your family, did they make wine as well? Is it something you grew up with? No. Um, uh, the truth is that we, we always had a, a vineyard, a small one, and uh, uh, we grew that. So uh, uh, during the September, normally we have this harvest. So, and uh, it was like uh, everybody was helping each other. So we booked the harvest so we could help each other. So yeah, today we could pick uh, the grapes uh, of uh, my vineyard and all the neighbors and friends come over and then have this great lunch and then party. And the next day uh, we'll go help uh, uh, my neighbor or some friend. And it was like uh, 10 days like this. So uh, hard work, but uh, full of party and, uh, and great lunches. Uh, but I never thought to, uh, um, to work in wine. It was something, the truth is that, uh, well, I studied biochemistry and uh, I, uh, the truth is that I never really knew what I wanted to do. There were so many things that I liked and uh, uh, so when I did my internship in, in Cullen, uh, in the lab, um, I asked if I could uh, work during the harvest and uh, they accept me and uh, 2005 was the first experience that I had in a, wine, in a winery. So uh, at that time uh, uh, I, I didn't have any kind of experience of course uh, uh, and it was uh, when I met uh, Marcin Obrega that right now is the responsible for the viticulture in, in Sajo Vinos. Uh, Ricardo Macedo that is responsible for the steel wines in Soja Vinos and Carlos Alves that is responsible for the port wines and we started together so uh, 2006 they called me if I was available to, to work during the harvest and I said yes of course <laughs> <laughs> because I, I really love it uh, and I love it everything the control maturation, maturation control that we could go uh, to different vineyards in different places and meet, uh, met the different people uh, through all the all the fermentation. Uh, so it, it, it was uh, an amazing experience. So um, in 2007, they invited me to work in full time. At that time, Marcio, Carlos and Ricardo, they already were, were working there. So it was, it, it was incredible because it was something that I... I, I, I I really like it, and I was working with people that uh, I consider my friends and people that I really, I really respect. So 
uh, and we've been working together until now. So it's been uh, fabulous. <laughs> That's nice to hear. It's in so 2020, nice to and then in 2020, uh, Sasha Vinge bought Quinta da Boa Vista, and they, they challenged me, they, they asked me if I was, uh, uh, if I wanted to, 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 to be the responsible for the knowledge of, of these wines. And, uh, well, it was impossible to say no, of course. <laughs> and, uh, so we are starting this, this new project. Super. So tell me how many hectares you have. Tell me a bit about the vineyard and your, your terroir there at Quinta. Okay, so Quinta da Boa Vista is one of the most uh, iconic uh, Quintas of Toro. So it's very near Pinhão. It's in the uh, north bank of the, the river. Um, it has about 80 hectares, but uh, only 36 are planted with vine. So all the rest is planted with different kinds of, uh, of trees that uh, helps to, to maintain the ecosystem that it's quite, quite important. And, um, and it's, it's very emblematic, not only for historical reasons, but also because it has these uh, amazing uh, uh, schistos walls uh, that sustain this terrace where we have this, this, these beautiful old vineyards planted. So, uh, it, it's something that when, when you pass through the, the road uh, and you look uh, at the, the other side and you see this uh, incredible thing that uh, it's almost impossible to imagine how, how it was built uh, and so, so long ago. So it's, it, it's quite amazing. So in, in this... Socalco. So, how do we say? Socalcos. Socalcos. Yes. That's it. So the whole... The well, whole we have is... that. Yes, and we have the ones that are larger, so you can have uh, um, uh, a few lines of, of vineyards, and you have ones that you only have a line, okay? So you have the terraces that normally have like eight, nine, ten, it depends, lines of vineyards, and then you have the sucalcus, normally you call it, uh, it's the ones that have only one line or two lines that are smaller. Normally that ones are uh, much older, uh, were most of them were from before um, Philoxera. So, and uh, Quinta do Ujo, Vinha do Ujo, uh, this old vineyard is planted in this, in this one. Mm -hmm. Yes, that one. Okay, so this is all planted with the Chocalcos. <laughs> yes. And the other ones are mainly in, in more terraces. Yes, we have, and the uh, Oratorio, that it's the other vineyard that we mm -hmm. have, uh, uh, old vineyard. Yes, that one. Uh, it's in terraces. And then we have more recent uh, vineyards that were planted in 2007. Uh, and that ones are, are different because uh, we have plots of only one sing with only one single grape. Okay, so in these okay. old vineyards like Ujo and Oratorio, we have a mix of different kinds of, of grapes. Uh, we know now that we have at least 25 different ones, but we have more. So it's, it's a study that we want to, to complete. Um, and, and, it, what make, and this makes them quite unique. So it's impossible to reproduce this wine in other places, mm. in other places with, uh, with, because we don't really know the quantity or the percentage of different grapes that we have there. So it's quite a mystery that... Uh, and that it's, uh, that it's part of the, the, the charm of the, the wines. Absolutely. I was looking through your tech sheets for the wines, and it's very interesting because you separated. You've got your Toriga Nacional, Toriga Franca, Tintacao, and then you've got old vines. <laughs> yes, it's true. No, no, so no what, breakdown. So is that because yes. you don't know exactly what you've got in these older vineyards at the moment? Yeah. So right now we, we are not sure. So it's something that we are studying and uh, when you work with these old vineyards, uh, it's it's it, it's quite um, uh, it's a, it's always a challenge because well you have different grapes so you have to treat them in in different ways and especially uh, when you have to harvest when you have to pick them uh, when you are uh, doing the maturation control you have to to be uh, very you have to pay very attention to what you have there because you are going to pick them at the same time. So you have to make sure that the, the final plant, so uh, the, the wine that you are going to make with this, with 
these grapes is going to be quite balanced and they have different uh, times of maturation. So to find the perfect time to pick uh, all of them, it's, it's, it's quite challenging, but at the same time, that's what makes the, uh, so, so, so great to work with this, with this kind of wine. Interesting. Yeah, I imagine. So if you've got around 25 different varieties in these old vines, and I imagine some of them will over, be overripe when you're picking them and some of them perhaps underripe. What are you looking for? Are you looking for kind of, how do you judge that? Because if you're picking it all together, it must be quite a challenge to decide when to harvest. Yes, it is. Is it a greater yes, it risk to go overripe when you're making wine rather than port? Or is it a greater risk to go underripe? Yeah, so what we do is basically, well, and we bought this, this Quinta in June. So during the uh, during august basically we were there every day <laughs> to understand what we have there and there are some grapes that you have in 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 in, uh, in bigger amount so you go for that and uh, before you, uh, and then you pick the grapes and and then before you you steam the them you 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 make like the uh, uh, you choose the ones that you think that are not uh, suitable for for this wine. Okay, so the ones that are overripe are are some of them are they stayed in the vine because most of the people that work with us knows what uh, what we want in the winery. Uh, but uh, before we we proceed, uh, before we 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 start the the fermentation, we select the ones that we don't want. So. Uh, that's another thing that we have to do to make sure that uh, uh, the final result is it's quite balanced. Excellent. And talking about when you pick your wine support, sorry, I'm going to have to let my cat in, otherwise she'll keep insisting. Um, <laughs> ah, you... I have to, I have to put meowing. mine in the kitchen. <laughs> and he was not very happy. <laughs> She's meowing at the door and desperate to come in. Um, so I've opened the window for her. Um, so when you're, when you're picking for port uh, versus wine, are you picking much later in order to get more alcohol potential or would you pick at the same time? Well, it depends. You know that in Douro, uh, well, this is a, a very vast region and uh, it, the vines are planted in different altitudes with different expositions to the sun. So it depends. Some of them we picked at the same time, others before, others later. It depends. It depends where you have the, the grapes. And, and it's very important to understand uh, what you are going to get uh, in the winery. So for that, during, uh, before we start picking the grapes, you have to, to go to all the vineyards and see what we have. And then we, have, uh, we do all the chemical analysis to, to help us to, uh, to understand how, how things are going. And then we, we book the, the, the harvest for the different places. So depending what kind of port wine you want to do and depending uh, where the grapes came from, uh, well, the, the time it's different. So, and uh, sometimes, and most of the times we are picking grapes for port wines and for uh, still wines at the same. Okay, but potentially at the same time then you're looking for similar qualities. Well, uh, not really. Well, in, in well, for port wines, um, you really want to grapes has a good, uh, a good uh, quantity of sugar, so they can because they have a slow, uh, a slow not a slow, a short uh, fermentation. Because at, at some point we are going to put the, the spirit that can stop the, the fermentation and uh, all the, so all the sugar that you have in this in these parts are, are natural. Uh, so. Uh, if you have grapes with a greater uh, quantity of sugar, you can have a, 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 lo a longer fermentation. So instead of fermentating two days, you can have like four. So you can extract more color, more tannins, more flavors. And that's very, very important. So, and for still wines right now, well, the alcohol is not the, the parameter that we are uh, seeing. It's not the most important. Most important thing is the balance. So you have to have a good acidity, good uh, good uh, good color. So uh, you can extract all the phenols that are necessary for a good aging, good tannins. So the parameters that you are seeing for, of course, the acidity is very important in ports. Okay, but uh, the parameters are different. So in port wine, of course, alcohol is always important, 
in steel wines, it's not the main thing that you are looking for. Excellent. Interesting. Super. I want to talk a little bit more about the vineyard um, and uh, talking a bit about your pre phylloxera vines versus your phylloxera vines. So why is it that some of yours were affected by phylloxera, I assume, and replanted, and then the pre phylloxera remains? Can you tell me about what happened? Well, <laughs> I mean, here in Doro, it affects the whole area. Yes. Well, Europe was devastated by mm. phylloxera. Uh, in the uh, and uh, window basically most of the vines were completely uh, dead. Uh, I think there are one or two that they say they are pre phylloxera, but uh, the truth is that in Doro, most of the, the vines uh, were dead, and uh, only after they discovered that the, this was an insect that uh, uh, um, damaged the, the roots of the plant, so and 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 she she she. She she couldn't get all the nutrients and what it needed to yeah. to survive, um, and then all the studies that were made by in in France and even in England, uh, and they discovered that the roots of uh, American um, varieties yes. were not sensible to this uh, this insect. So uh, they bring the this this uh, species from from America because phylloxera came from America. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they and then they they put uh, the 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 Portuguese varieties or the European varieties in in this one. So uh, right now here in Portugal, I know that uh, like in Coulage, you know Coulage near Lisbon, so yeah. it's a very yeah, sandy right. sandy sandy soil. Uh, uh, they were not affected by phylloxera because the, the insect didn't didn't uh, survive in this uh, in this kind of soils. But in Douro, right now, most of the vineyards are, are after the phylloxera time. So uh, you can have like uh, vineyards with uh, 100 years old that were planted in the, in the end of the 19th century. Uh, and, you, and you can have two new vineyards that came over in the last years. That, uh, uh, and something changed, like Oratorio and Uju, uh, the references that we have that they were registered in 1930, so we, we are not sure if they were planted at that time or if only were registered at that time. So, but at least they have like 90 years old, and uh, yeah. when you look at them, you say well, it's amazing. <laughs> so they're not. So the, none of your vines are pre phylloxera they're, No, they're all plant. Okay, all right. I must have missed mis misread that. So, what rootstocks have you planted everything on? Do you know what rootstocks they were planted on? No, these ones I don't know. I can tell you. I, I'm well. Some of them uh, we 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 start to look for the ones that are wild, so they were not uh, stimulated with the other ones. But uh, right now I can I can tell you. Uh, it's 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 quite difficult to say to say because they were not planted by us. So. Yeah, I imagine that's a lot. It's quite hard <laughs> to go back and uh, find the records of that. Super. What are the other, so phylloxera, obviously not an issue now because you've got your American root stocks, but are there any other pests or diseases that are troublesome in the valley? Yes, uh, we have Wuidium and Mildium that uh, also came from America. Uh, <laughs> the, God, yes, God bless it's true. America. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, uh, the truth is that when you, when you start to have this, all this, uh, uh, travels between continents and you have to, to bring and uh, uh, new spaces and new diseases appear, of course. And uh, the, this yeah, one came from true, that. Never a true word during a, a year and a half of a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have to tell them. <laughs> yeah. So, well, with you, you all, you always have with you, so you have to be very careful to, to prevent it, basically. And mildew, you only have it when you have like rain in May and June. And, uh, and you have to be very, very careful because when that happens, you, you can damage all the, 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 the harvest. So uh, it's something that uh, we have to, to plan and to, to be very attention to all the climatic uh, the weather conditions so we can prevent it and don't have problems with that. And we have some plagues like... Uh, Cigarinha, some insects that uh, the moth, the moth uh, that uh, we use um, 
we use, uh, so we don't use insecticides in, in okay. the kingdom of Ovist and in the other kingdoms of Sargevinge. We use this um, pheromone, uh, female pheromone that we spread in, in the vineyard. So the males, when are going to try to meet the, the females, get confused and can find them so they can procreate. Um, it's called the sexual disruption. Right now in Doru, many companies are using it. Uh, Sajavin was one of the first ones to use it. We started in 2007 and it's quite efficient. It works very well. And uh, you don't, uh, and all the other species are not affected by it. So it's uh, it's something that um, we use in Kintadovic. And they, Lehman Smith also use it. So we could see it in, in the vineyards when we went there. And it's something that um, we try always to have this sustainability in the vineyard so we can have a, a, not the perfect ecosystem, of course, but we try to, 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 to reduce everything that it's, uh, it's going to damage soils and uh, all, all the other species. So we are trying to reduce copper too. And um, this is a, a work in progress always. So trying to to be sustainable, but at the same time, be sure that uh, uh, we are going to pick uh, uh, good quality grapes. So that's uh, two things that are quite important and they have to be very well balanced. Super. And so most of you, your soils are all the typical kind of Doro schist, is that right? Yes, yes, yes. Is, is there anything that you need to do in terms of nutrients, um, treatments for schist? Yeah, so... The, uh, well, we have to, every year we do an analysis of the soil and the leaves of the plants. So we see mm -hmm. if everything is okay. And when you, you have, uh, and when you detect that you miss some micronutrient, then uh, next year you are going to, to put it in the vines. Yes, we try to always to, to maintain, uh, you know, that vines, uh, the plant needs some stress, hydric stress and, yeah. To, to really give you good grapes, but also you also have to treat it well so she can give you what you want. It's 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 only it's with people like that and uh, even with plants. <laughs> so we try to maintain this good relationship with our plants and treat them well so we can have what we we need to to produce good wines. Excellent. And it's a, it's kind of an MW question really, but. Are there any nutrients in particular that schist soils are lacking? Well, the, normally this, this, uh, the, the biggest problem is the acidity of the soil. So when you have schist soil, have uh, this, the, the acidity of uh, the soil, it's, uh, it's, um, it's more acid. So there are some nutrients that uh, are not so available uh, for for um, for the plants, so you have to to have to control the acidity of the soil, and sometimes you have to to put the nutrients that are not so available. I'm not sure, but I think uh, um, I say it's phosphor. I think it's one of them. I, I'm not right now. Well, Mars, you could answer you better <laughs> this one. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm, I'm not mean. an expert. <laughs> uh, the truth is that I'm not an expert in the vineyards, of course. Everything I know is like I've been studying, of course, but I know uh, because I work with them and uh, Marcio is quite an expert in these things. So I think this would be a good question okay. for him. <laughs> <laughs> Super. I will ask him. Okay, perfect. So let's move on to the kind of potential of still wines in the Doro. Um, because as I understand, all of your vineyards are actually grade A for port production too. Yeah, so, well, Doro Valley, uh, until like 30 years old, everything in Doro Valley was made to produce port wine. Mm. So we have, we have this uh, uh, method to classify uh, vineyards uh, that goes from A to F, uh, and A is the better one. Uh, that uh, uh, puts uh, all the parameters, so the type of grapes that you have in that vineyard, the soil that you have, the exposition to the sand, the altitude, well, there are plenty of them. And um, uh, when you look for, uh, for that kind of classification, normally the A letter, that is the best one for port wines, is not uh, always the best one for steel wines, because normally it means that you are going to have high concentrated wines, uh, 
with a good uh, sugar level mm -hmm. and uh, well sometimes it's not what you want for 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 the still wines but you can get very good wines in that uh, in that areas too and uh, and everything was 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 thinking for port wine like the winery so big tanks where you could uh, could uh, make uh, uh, fermentation uh, big or fermentation so everything was was and 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 the truth is that you didn't have so many tanks uh, because uh, the fermentation was quite short. After three days, you were taking that one and put and you put yeah. uh, another one. And it, for sea wines, uh, that doesn't happen. So at least you need six days. And six days, it's for the the, the lighter wine. So normally, you, you are going to make like a cool maceration or an after maceration, and it takes uh, longer than that. Uh, so... Uh, everything uh, had to change uh, even even the vines the, the grapes that you plant for port wines of course they are very suitable for steel wines but there are, there are some other some other ones that perhaps they are not so interesting for for port wines that are very very interesting for for steel wines if, especially if you are want to make different kind of things like uh, and you can see that like uh, uh, grapes like donzlinho or uh, Rofiet, uh, that uh, are grapes that don't give you uh, so many color and they are, well, they are very delicate uh, flavor. And, but perhaps for part time, they are not so in interesting. Uh, right now, uh, they, they almost disappear. And right now, people are starting to, to replant it again because uh, you can have a different profile of wines in Douro that... Uh, um you you can't get with a Turiga Nacional or a Turiga Franca that are grapes that are full of body with uh, good tannins, good uh, good color and everything is so so intense. Okay. Um so like 30 years ago and perhaps because um, plenty of people start to, to study outside uh, in, in abroad in other countries, start to um, work in other in the other parts of the, the world. Uh, I think when they came back and start to study better the, the terroir and the grapes that we have here and start to, to make their own uh, steel wines, well, everything started to change. And the truth is that uh, we discovered that it's possible to make great, great, great uh, steel wines in Zora. So uh, right now it's something that uh, it's still a challenge, you know. So Zora is so... It's huge, and you have so many places with different conditions and so many grapes to, to explore. So, uh, the truth is, uh, every day that we are going to work, we are learning something uh, more. And uh, after a, a, every harvest, we have we 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 ended it with full of uh, new ideas that we can can try and experiment and see how, how it's going. So, even for white wine, so. Most uh, like 20 years ago, you couldn't try a good white wine from Doran. Right now, you have uh, yeah. beautiful ones. I'm really, I'm really excited about both Doro whites and reds. I think you know the region is capable of making excellent still wines. Um, have you already been to Doro, Amanda? I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like ah, to go okay. back. Um, but I, yeah, I've been a couple of times. It's one of my favorite wine regions. I think it's stunning, absolutely gorgeous place to visit. Great wines, great food, yeah. and gorgeous views. I, I particularly like the swimming pools that um, just disappear off the edge yeah. of the hill. <laughs> yeah, they are beautiful. They are be we don't have one, but I'm, I'm going to, to talk to someone to put one in there. But uh, it's beautiful. I hope next time you come and visit us in Kinsa oh, I think to. you are going be, to, be to love better, it. Always better to be there in the vineyard. Um, yes, but true. commercially, has it, has it been quite successful selling the still wines over port? What, you know, what's been the commercial acceptance of, of still red wines from the Douro? Well, it's not easy. It's mm. not easy because uh, when you go, like, You go to United States and you ask for a wine. You don't ask uh, for uh, a label. You ask for a grape. Yeah. Yeah. So you go and uh, I want a Chardonnay or I want a Sauvignon Blanc. So it's quite right now. Most of the people don't know the grapes, but most of all, 
don't know how to pronunciate them. So it's not easy to say vizinho or say <laughs> Gouveia or say it's not a to count. I, I, I understand that it's not easy. But the truth is that when, when you try a wine from Douro or from Portugal, most of the regions have uh, 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 grape, use grapes uh, that are Portuguese grapes. So we have about 350 different grapes in all over Portugal. Mm -hmm. And in, in Douro, we have about uh, more than 100 that you can use. So every time that you taste these wines are completely different. So someone that in England or in America that tastes the Portuguese wines is tasting something that he never tasted before because he, he, these kind of grapes are not, used, uh, are not spread all over the world as is uh, Sauvignon or Cabernet or all, all of them. So uh, this is uh, quite exotic at the same yeah. time. But uh, right now, I think the first uh, things are getting better, of course. Um, uh, most of all, because wines are, are very good. Uh, but it's not easy to, to show wine and say, well, uh, right now you are going to for forgot, uh, forget the Merlot and now you are going to, to drink to Viga Franco, to Viga Nacional. So uh, that's something that we have to work Uh, I think that's the, that this is the way so um, people start to recognize our grapes and uh, our value. Uh, uh, it's a work in progress too. Uh, but, uh, but, but I think uh, now people start to recognize Portuguese wines as, as good, good wines, a good value wine. So um, I hope we have to, many things to do and uh, to, to improve. But um, I think we are in a, in a good way, I hope. I hope so too. And I think you've got such an irrepressible terroir and, and identity that actually yeah. I think these wines are so, you know, they deserve to be kind of world recognized. So now we, we will talk about the great varieties. <laughs> <You've been laughs> there, and now you can laugh at my pronunciation. So let's start with uh, Toriga Nacional. The Very easiest good. one to pronounce. <laughs> Can you tell me a bit about how it is in the vineyard and, and how it is in the winery in terms of its kind of properties as a grape variety? Well, this is a very plastic um, uh, grape, so you can find it all over Portugal. It came from uh, Dão and Douro. We have this dispute. We, mm. we say that it's from <laughs> Douro, Dão says it. But perhaps I think it's from Dão, really. Uh, but you can find it everywhere. And uh, even uh, in other countries. Right now, it's quite used uh, to find in the California, Australia, South Africa, even in Argentina. So this is, a, and, um, and it has a good reason because uh, it, it's very adaptable to different soils and different conditions. And um, it gives you always a very, very good fruit. So normally these wines are very flavored. Mm -hmm. These are exuber very exuberant. So have this flower Uh, nuances that are incredible. Uh, they have good fruit and uh, good tannins. Normally, the wines are very, very uh, attractive. People really, uh, the first time that they try it, they really like it. So this is a grape that, uh, and perhaps because of that, uh, it's uh, you can find it in so many places. Excellent. And uh, Turiga Franca as the kind of comparison to Nacional. Okay, so Trigo Nacional is a very old uh, grape from Portugal. So before Phylloxera, uh, 90% of the region, of the region, were planted with uh, Trigo Nacional. Oh, okay. And yeah, yeah, so that's why they say it's, it's from there and perhaps they, <laughs> they are right. <laughs> uh, and uh, after Phylloxera, uh, we, uh, they replanted. Uh, and... Uh, and um, Turiga Frank, it's a grape that started after Philoxera. So it's a very young grape. And you can see that because it doesn't have many genetic diversity in the clones. So, okay. And uh, uh, I think it's, it, 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 uh, it's a, a, an hybrid from Turiga Nacional and from Morisco. So Morisco was as a grape, uh, it was a grape that was uh, more resistant to Philoxera. So they, they try, and, and Turiga Nacional was the grape that everybody loved. So they tried to, to mix them together. And uh, uh, this is how Turiga Frank uh, was born. Well, this is, uh, I'm not sure if 
it's right like that. But the truth is that the mix of the two of them, <laughs> perhaps the rest, it's a little bit of romance. I'm not sure, but it makes sense. It makes sense that it's like that. So uh, Trigger Frank, it's quite different from uh, Trigger National. So Trigger National is very exuberant in the nose. Trigger Frank is also exuberant, but more fruity. So in this one, we are going to find more fruitiness, uh, the tannins, uh, if it's, it's, uh, it's picked at, uh, uh, with perfect maturation, the tannins are quite soft. It, it's, it's full body. Normally, the Turiga Nacional, it's not so intense in the mouth. Uh, uh, but it, it's a grape that, uh, uh, that we really loved. It's something that you can find in most of the blends of, of Toro Valley. Um, not, not only in steel wines, but also in port wine. So most of the vintage that, uh, that um, that are made in uh, right now uh, have a good percentage of uh, Turiga Franca for sure because it's so robust, it's a uh, tal, and it fools your mouth. It's uh, it's uh, it's incredible. Excellent. Is it more productive? Does it yield more than national? Yes, okay. yes, yes, and it has uh, bigger branches. So because Turiga National has these small ones. And it's very hard to work in, in the in the field because uh, it's not so. And Trigger Frank, it's the opposite. It's much more friendly of mm. the. <laughs> the vit and, and that's why normally we say that it's the consensual uh, grape for the peop for the the grower, the one to take care of it in in the field, and for the the winemaker because both of them really like them. It's quite friendly. It's uh, it's and. Uh, when when you pick it at the perfect maturation, it's it's uh, it's something quite amazing. Super. So tinta cow. Tinta cow. Tinta cow. Do you know what cow means? Isn't it like wild dog or something? It, it, yeah, it's a red dog. <laughs> <laughs> so tinta cow. It's a grape that. Um, uh, well. Uh, it almost disappeared. Right now, mm -hmm. we restart to, to replant it. And uh, we, in, in Quinta de Boavista, we have tinto cão. Uh, this is a grape that uh, with a long maturation. So normally, it's the last one that we pick. And uh, it's very good because it's quite resistant to the, to, the, to, the, um, to the dryness, to the sun. So it has always a good performance. So it's, it's a grape that um, most of the people really like to, to work in the field. In the winery, normally it uh, doesn't give you, it's not, uh, if you are looking for color, you are not going to, to, to make a wine for, uh, with Tinto Cão. But if you are looking like for uh, uh, good acidity, good balance, good tannins, uh, elegance, I, I think this, this Tinto Cão usually works very well. And it works very well even in blends. So normally it gives the, a good freshness in the final blends. So, it's um, Super. and it's a grape that most of the people right now are replanting because of the 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 climate changing. So and because it's very well adapted to to the dryness, uh, Tintcão it's a it's a good choice if you are going to replant a a, 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 a vineyard. This would be a grape that you want to have in in your vineyard. Excellent. Atoriga Nacional and Franca are also quite um, good for heat and drought conditions, or do they struggle a bit more? Well, Atoriga Nacional, it's very well adapted to. Atoriga um, Franca, it's not, it, it doesn't have a, such a good performance with the with with hot. So, mm -hmm. uh, and normally, um, w w when you have like a very hot weather, especially in August and September, it takes longer to, to maturate because the, they stopped doing the photosynthesis and then it takes longer to... Sometimes it's, it's, it's not very easy to get the, the perfect maturation. But, uh, but yes, all of them are quite, uh, quite adaptable and, uh, for, for, for the region and uh, for now for the climate changes. Let's see what's going to happen. Are there any varieties in the region that are disappearing because of the change in climate? Are there any that you think might kind of be lost well, uh, as the climate changes? Well, the ones that have these precursors uh, maturations can have more difficulties to, 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 to have a good performance. Let's see what's happened. Of course, 
it's not only we try to work in the vineyards so in a manner that we can they can have uh, better conditions to survive so uh even everything is being rethinking so like uh, to irrigate vineyards and uh, have uh, uh planted them in 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 places where they, had, they they don't have so much exposition to the sun especially in the afternoon uh so we are trying not to not to um, not to select only the ones that are more suitable but most of all adapting all the, the cultures uh, the way of work in the vineyard so they can have their own space too because well doro Uh, one of the things that make this 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 wine so special and this region so special is this is uh, diversity Absolutely. and when you have so many things to work with uh, so many grapes so so different altitudes and expositions of sun and well normally you can you have all the the, the tools to make a, a more balanced wine or something more special Excellent. So uh, I'm really interested about your kind of adaptation for climate change. So you mentioned replanting in different exposures, so I guess northerly exposures to Yes, north, east mm -hmm. to so in in Quinta da Boa Vista the, the the grapes that we use, most of the grapes that uh, were used and we used in 2020 for make the, to make the the still wines came from the, the, the place that were this, that, that they have the, have the uh, east exposition to the sun or north. Okay. So to make sure that after four o'clock, they are not so exposure to the sun. That's the, the most dangerous time because they, uh, they went all day with sun and they are quite dry. And so uh, if, you, if you have sun until the end of the day, it's going to be more stressful and uh, even the, uh, the temperature during the night is going to, it's not going to refresh uh, as uh, it could. So you try to plant them in, 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 uh, in, uh, in um, not so exposed places. And, once, and the places that you have with the uh, uh, like south exposure, you are going to plant uh, grapes that are more adaptable, like Tintucan or Trigonsuna, for instance. Super. And you mentioned irrigation. Are you irrigating the vineyards? No, we don't do it. It's something that we are thinking. No, not in Quinta de Boavista. Uh, right now, I think we don't need it. To, uh, you know that uh, one thing that it's, it's, it's surprising that in this Quinta you have uh, mines. Mm. I think it's mines. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, something they, they excavate in the soil and uh, uh, to find water. And normally they, they have these... Uh, It was used especially for the new plantations that you have to irrigate because they are they have the roots are very superficial. So, um, but uh, in Kitlebovice you have some water lines that uh, that helps. Uh, but for instance, uh, such a vineyard as in other quintas like in Superior Douro, in mm -hmm. Upper Douro, and it's something that uh, must be considered. We are not doing it. We'll see how things are. But it's something that uh, has been studied because, well, things are changing and we have to adapt to. Interesting. Super. So we should definitely taste. I've, I've, I've already just been tasting through these wines. So can you tell me about the? So we first got your Reserva line. So this yeah. is where you have Turriga Nacional, Franca, Cow, and this kind of field blend. Yes, yes. So, um, uh, Quinta Boa Vista started, this still project uh, started in 2013. So Lehman Smith bought this, this, this Quinta and they decided to make uh, uh, excellent premium wines. And, and I think they, they get it. Uh, and then they selected like these old vines, so Oratório and Ujo, to, to, to basically to make the single wines from only from that, uh, that uh, Quinta. And then we have all the rest of the Quinta. So, and they select uh, the, the grapes that they think that were more suitable and more and could make a, a good blend. The, the, the thing is that uh, these vineyards are in the, in the, all the, they cover most of the Quinta. So uh, you have like the, 
it seems like it's the essentia of the Quinta. So I have a little bit of old vines and you have Tinto Crown that it's uh, in upper, uh, upper uh, place of the Quinta in, uh, to the east. Uh, you have Triga Nacional that it's to, to west uh, mm -hmm. uh, and Triga Franca that it's in the middle. So uh, it seems like they, they want to cover all, all the Quinta. Uh, and these wines are, so this blend is made to basically to express the, the terroir, the full terroir. Mm. So we, you have 2015, uh, 15, 16 yeah. and 17, exactly. isn't it? Mm. So uh, they, they are from different years and you can find the difference because of the years. Uh, so 15, it's a little bit more uh, uh, fresh. Mm. Uh, it was like a, it was a good year, so it was quite dry during the spring, but it, it rained during the winter. And, uh, well, the, 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 the harvest time was quite uh, smooth, not too hot. Mm. And then we have the 16, that was a, a very good year. Uh, we have rain during the winter, and then it was quite dry, but uh, it's quite balanced. It's, it's a very balanced wine. Mm. Well, it was a classic for the vintage port. Uh, and we have the 17, that it was like uh, perhaps the driest year that I remember. So mm -hmm. everything, it was the winter was dry and hot, the spring was dry and hot. Well, and the harvest was very dry and very, very hot. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it was the first, and I, I, I don't remember to, to have like a, a, such a short uh, Harvest, you know, like in three <laughs> weeks, we have to pick everything and uh, do do all the wines. It goes very well, but it was uh, quite a challenge. So in Quinta de Boa Vista, I really don't know um, how things went, but uh, the truth is that this was like the the global for for the, the region, and we have a Quinta very near, very near Quinta de Boa Vista. So I think it it, it would be uh, very similar. And you can find that in the wine. So you have this 15 that is uh, quite fresh and, um, and it's more. You have all the spices that come over in, in first and then you have the fruitiness in the end. Uh, it has uh, a great acidity, so it, it's very fresh. I think 15 for me is actually the one that, um, that I'm tasting now. I mean, obviously it's going to be different after they've been decanted for a bit longer. But 15 for me is certainly one of the more kind of balanced the most balanced of them all. I love the freshness. I really like the kind of rich, plummy fruit notes that you've got in there too, and some of the floor. Yes, yes, I agree with you. It's one that is more fresh, and you can mm. find it uh, not only in the nose, but in the mouth. It stays yeah. for a long time, and this freshness um, helps to, to come to everything else come over, isn't it? So we have mm. the fruitiness and the plump, the sherry, and... Uh, uh, the spices like cloves and nutmeg that and every time that you drink it uh something else come over and i th i think this is the the most interesting thing thing in, in this in these wines it's that um they 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 stayed about uh, i think 16 months in in french oak barrels so that helps but you really need to have a very good uh, uh wine to 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 be for uh so, so to be to have to all this wood time yeah. and uh, at the same time you, you drink it and uh, well you only notice the flavors but you don't feel the the, yeah. the oak in the mouth i mean the fruit really pops out we've got a question Isn't here it? we've got a question how much new oak is in there what percentage of new oak is in the 216 well um i'm not sure but yeah. uh uh, this year, because, uh, well, Quinta de Bovista uh, was working with Monsieur Berouet. There is uh, this uh, star of wines, of course. He worked for 40 years in Petrus, in mm. Chateau Petrus. So he's, he's, a, he's a person with a great experience and knowledge. And, uh, well, uh, such events invite him to, to, to continue the, the project with us. And he accepts. So... This year, when we tasted 2020 and we were deciding uh, um, the percentage of new oak, uh, uh, at the beginning we said, well, perhaps uh, about 40%. And, 
and then and it's it's a very it's a very um relaxed person like uh you know when you i, I never I, i didn't meet him personally yet because of the pandemic mm. but we talk on the phone and we change uh, some mails and uh, and you and he said like kind of perhaps uh, we could use uh, between 25 and 30 so perhaps you don't want that uh, uh the new oak uh, be so evident in the final wines and then we taste the the wines again and said well perhaps uh, it's quite right so i'm not sure if they were using this percentage in these wines but perhaps and because he's uh, he worked in in this project since the beginning perhaps it, it would be the 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 percentage that uh, were used in this ones excellent super yeah i th i was going to ask you what what changes you've made with him but i guess that answers the question so we need to we've only got five minutes left because otherwise the video won't save so <laughs> so we'll have to <laughs> we'll have to taste these last two wines um so oratorio can you tell me why it's called oratorio and a bit about this wine and the main kind of differences with ujo ujo okay so oratorio Well, oratory in Portuguese means like a, a place where you pray. Yeah, I thought that. And yeah, and probably because it has these huge walls of schist that uh, some of them have more than eight eight met meters of high, uh, and perhaps it's because of that. Well, next time you came to Douro, uh, we will go to Quinta da Boa Vista and you'll see it. And we are going to taste these wines there, and then everything now will be will make sense. Okay, <laughs> so um, this one is 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 faced to to east, so it has uh, sun during all morning and a part of the afternoon, but the end of the day it's in the shadow. So that what how that helps quite a lot, uh, especially in the winter. I'm sorry, in the summer. And Ushu is. Uh, one single vineyard that we have uh, uh, old one too that it's in the north it's face to north so this one it's less exposed than the oratorio and you can find that in here mm -hmm. so oratorio normally it's more jammy more fruity yeah. uh, very spicy uh, uh, and the uh, ujo you will find more this uh, Florist notes like yeah. cedar, and it's more semic, uh, more fresh, too, and you can find it even in the mouth. So uh, uh, they are quite, quite different, and they have a different uh, percentage of grapes, too. We are not uh, right now, I can tell that uh, we found uh, quite a lot of Rufet in, um, in Uju. So Rufet, it's a, it's, a, it's a grape that gives you like good tannins, uh, good acidity. Uh, but it's it's not very colorful, so it's, it's a great. Uh, mm. uh, it's very good to make roses, for instance. And uh, but um, I think this freshness comes from this kind of grapes. Not only because it's fa the vineyard is faced north, but uh, it has this percentage of grapes that uh, really gives them a little bit more freshness. Yeah, I love. I, I think they're both really really great wines and very different personalities. I agree. I think the oratorio is perhaps more the masculine, um, yes. slightly kind the of... seductor, isn't it? You know, like... it's, a, it's more your kind of steak wine, whereas um, your ujo is much more kind of delicate. And as soon as I poured it, it was so perfumed. And my first kind of taste, you know, it was just perfume. And it's lovely. It's really, really floral and, and, and really expressive and, and much kind of juicier as well on the palate and fresher, as you said. So totally different and, and a really beautiful duo to kind of see some of these old vines. How old are the vines for both of these wines? They're, these are um, older parts. They have about uh, at least 90 years old, mm -hmm. at least. So because they were registered in 1930, but we are not sure if they were planted before that. Okay. So at least they have 90 mm -hmm. years old. Nice, very old then. <laughs> yeah. And um, before we finish, um, one someone here who's tasting along with us says that he's just tried the thirteen and the, and uh, and it's very expressive. So, how long do you think you can keep some of these, um, you know, more complex Doro red still wines? Well, I think I I tasted thirteen uh, like three months ago or four months ago, and it's still maintains this fruitiness, this uh, mm. um, 
uh, this freshness. So I think these are wines that, uh, like the vines, can 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 have a good good time of uh, of life. So uh, I I can tell like ten, twenty, thirty. I'm not sure. So we'll see with time what's going to happen. But uh, the the ones that I've tried, the first ones that they made and I tried, they they have um, they are great. So they and I think they can. You can keep it for uh, a few more, more years. So I think these are kind of wines that you can you can buy it and drink it right now. I think they are very 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 pleasant right yeah. now. But uh, I think with time they will develop uh, more elegant. They will become more elegant, more velvety, more. Uh, but always maintaining this uh, this this freshness that is quite essential for 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 the life of the wine. Excellent. I've really, really enjoyed talking to you, Carla. Thank you so much for your time and, uh, and thank you for sharing these wines. And I really look forward to visiting you one day soon yeah. and, and, and seeing, tasting your first vintages. So, <laughs> Okay, I, I hope I will meet you things. here. I hope so. So thank you for, so much for, for having me, Amanda. So see you soon. I hope so. I hope so. Thank you and uh, enjoy thank the you. spring. Happy Easter. Thank you. <laughs> Obrigada. <laughs> Obrigada, thank you. <laughs>